I did a talk called How to Survive, which drew on my experience as a Boy Scout, which is if you are in unfamiliar terrain, if you are disoriented, if you're dehydrated, what do you do to survive? And I think that many of us went through that phase. We need to design our organizations for uncertainty and being able to be more nimble and more flexible and agile as a matter of course, just because 2020 proved how uncertain life can be. But going through a near-death experience makes you stronger in the long run. I think out of the pandemic, what you've seen is that the businesses who have been able to pivot their business model a bit or pivot how they do things and react in an agile way have been the most successful businesses. Don't leave yourself inflexible. Make sure that as new information comes in, you're able to react to them. So these black swan events that might only happen once a lifetime, it doesn't make sense to set your business up in case there's another pandemic because that makes you inefficient. But it's a mindset that is then put into practice by the way that you set things up, the way that you set up your systems, the way that you choose your priorities, the way that you stretch your teams. A few years ago, people were saying, OK, do you know how to use Excel? Do you know how to use Word? Do you know how to use PowerPoint? In a few years, people will expect you to be able to use automation tools to digitize some of your manual repetitive work because that's going to improve your productivity. And the pandemic has actually created a clear urgency that people had to go this way. Because any business that is not designed to operate digitally would not succeed. We now learn to actually be far more in demand with our human capabilities in our future jobs because the very repetitive, simple tasks are going to be taken over by software robots that we create and we control. The pandemic has been very interesting in highlighting a lot of issues that many of us were aware of for some time, but they've really come to the fore. Black minority ethnic founders have really had ongoing challenges in accessing investment compared with their white and often male counterparts. And at the same time, where you live is a second challenge. Put those two together and as a black woman founder living in Leeds, that's an incredibly challenging issue for you to deal with. So we've had to really look at things from a different lens and as investors make changes. 2020 showed us that even the most certain predictions can be eliminated by a problem that affects humanity. For every real entrepreneur, there is something at the very core of everything that we're doing, and this is the purpose. Why is it so significantly important for me to solve a certain problem? Right now, it is even more important to really think, what am I doing with my limited time on this planet? For many investors in the pandemic, it's actually really changed their thinking and they will build issues like social impact and sustainability into their investment thesis. So when you're an entrepreneur approaching investors right now, you need to really think how far you can show that you're going to make a really strong impact, either socially, environmentally, globally, that will really help you tune in to where investors are focused right now. So it won't be enough just to have a great technology. It's got to really have that wider and deeper sense of long-term impact. And I think that's really going to attract investment much more successfully in the year ahead. We see a lot of businesses that have a very strong purpose-driven approach. And that really, I think, is going to be a lot of the future for global development. We had feared that COVID would derail us. In fact, businesses actually are embracing the sustainable development goals as an opportunity. Because of the disruption that we're going through, there are many opportunities opening up here for social entrepreneurs with the right business model, with the right outreach, with the right thinking around how to leverage digital technologies in a better way. We need a lot of innovation, a lot of creativity in those spaces. It doesn't need to be a trade-off between profit and doing good. It actually can be both. On the space station, you realize how interconnected we all are and how interconnected we are with our environment. When I look at what's happening around the world, 
is shaking people up to realize that when a problem happens in Wuhan, it impacts the entire world. It can bring large economies to their knees. And this time was a virus. Next time it could be something different, climate change, for example. So let's not just be naive and let's do something now. From everything we've learned, I see more people talking about long-term thinking because they don't want to deal with something like this again. We have the opportunity to create businesses which follow a new set of rules. What we've given up to a certain extent is our wellness as we're being invaded by too much news, too much information, too many demands on our time. And being able to step back and say, that doesn't contribute to my wellness. What does is having the time to go for a walk and to switch off. How do we build companies which take people's need for that lifestyle into account? How do we design jobs which don't infringe on our physical and mental wellness? And that to me is the essence of build back better. Good morning. Welcome to OSEF X. I'm Peter Tefano. I'm the Dean here at Said Business School and I'm thrilled to welcome everybody this morning. The speakers that you've just heard from, they have been talking about what's different between now and last year. And so I'd like to start my remarks in the same way. A year ago, we were physically in Said Business School. It was the last large event that we held. Uh, and some of the speakers that you just heard were our guests last year. What's different in a year? Well, obviously we're finding ourselves online. That's okay, we can handle that. We're dealing with the pandemic. But I wanna reflect on the kind of, you know, the role of entrepreneurship and maybe how it's changed just a little tiny bit in the last year, reflecting on you know, perhaps the most entrepreneurial venture that's going on in the world, which is the vaccines and pandemic recovery. So if you think about the vaccines, um, you know, some of them are created by entrepreneurial firms, including, you know, a very entrepreneurial lab here in Oxford. But those entrepreneurs alone aren't sufficiently powerful to actually solve the world's problems. So those entrepreneurs teamed up, in our case, with AstraZeneca, a big firm. But you know what? An entrepreneur plus AstraZeneca, that can't solve the problem either. They need to team up here in the UK with the government, it's the NHS. And so the NHS is now in a massive distribution uh, phase. But, you know, having just got my vaccine, I can tell you that's not enough either, because if you go to a, distribu a vaccine distribution site, what you find is that for every NHS employee, there are probably 30 or 40 volunteers. So civil society. So in order to really build back better, entrepreneurs are going to be important. But I think we're going to find that we're going to have to work across boundaries between entrepreneurs, large firms, them and government, and them and civil society. That's going to be the model, I think, that in not all cases, but in some cases, especially as we think about building back better, um, it's going to take partnerships where before we might have competed. You know, entrepreneurs may have looked at large firms as a target or an opportunity, and they still are in some sense. But the big issues in the world will probably be solved by us working across those boundaries. And as I was sitting there getting my vaccine uh, last week, thinking, wow, look at all these volunteers and the doctors were thanking them and the doctors were from the NHS and the, and the vaccine was produced by AstraZeneca, but the fundamental science came from a set of entrepreneurs who are sitting in a university. It shows to me the whole ecosystem of how the various bits work together. So some things have changed, but at the core of it, if it wasn't for entrepreneurs, people who think differently, who do things differently, who challenge boundaries, I don't think we would have gotten to where we are right now. And so I'm thrilled that OSEF is live on today and you've got a great lineup. Um, starting that lineup is Nicholas Enstrom. Uh, Nicholas, uh, I had the opportunity to meet a number of years ago in the course of, I think it was Founders Forum or one of those events. Um, Nicholas, if you don't know him, was uh, one of the founders of uh, Skype, a business that has fundamentally changed the world, along with a number of other businesses that he's created, like Casa. As if that wasn't enough, he then went off to found Atomico in 20, 2006. And Atomico was one of the leading investors in a number of firms, including one that you just saw. I think we just saw a little video from Lilium, and I believe that's one of yours, uh, Nicholas. Um, 
if you take the clock back not one year, but 10 years ago, this event was called Silicon Valley Comes to Oxford. We were oriented around Silicon Valley as the role model for how it is that entrepreneurs could do the work that they do. Um, Nichols, on the other hand, is the president of the European Tech Alliance, um, an organization that uh, recognizes that you know, entrepreneurship and big tech and all that doesn't have to be tied to one geography. In fact, if there's one thing that I've learned over my tenure, tenure as dean, is that entrepreneurs are everywhere. Entrepreneurship is everywhere. And what we can do here at the school and at the university and beyond is to try to nurture and support entrepreneurs no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing. And OSFX is that mission tried to brought to life. And so this morning, I know there are a couple of thousand people signed up. I don't know how many of you are on at this point in the morning, um, but I'm really, really thrilled that you're here. My only regret is that we can't be together um, where for those of you who know how we would normally start OSEF, I would holler at the audience, good morning, and you'd holler back and we get our, our, uh, our, our blood going because it's gonna be an exciting day. So I'd like to make that an exciting day start and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Thomas Hellman. Uh, Thomas is the DP World Professor of Entrepreneurship Innovation. Um, he runs Creative Destruction Lab and our Entrepreneurship Center in conjunction with Maria Zubaldia and, and a great team that you're gonna see here. And Thomas will be in conversation with Nicholas, and I'm going to go off camera and listen intently because I'm looking forward to this conversation, as I'm sure you are too. Have a great day. Good morning, everybody. Um, it is a real pleasure to welcome Nicholas Zenstrom. Um, we've been wanting to have Nicholas Zenstrom for many years, and maybe one of the benefits of the pandemic is that we actually um, managed to put him on the calendar today. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome Nicholas. Um, I believe we're going to see him on camera any moment now. And then we're going to have a, a so to speak, a fire chat very briefly. I'm Thomas Hellman, Professor of Entrepreneurship and Site Lead of the, of the Creative Destruction Lab, which is supporting um, OSEF run by the, our own entrepreneurship center. Is Nicholas with us? I'm here. Wonderful, wonderful. Nicholas, it's great to see you. So um, let's get straight into it. Um, Peter already introduced you. You are definitely a serial entrepreneur, somebody who can't stop starting new organizations, but the organizations you started are very different. Before Skype, you actually started several other companies. Then came Skype. Um, which is obviously, you know, a, a story we all are super excited about. The, frankly, the technology is the foundation of what we're doing today. Um, and then you started Atomico, which is a leading European venture capital firm. Can you just give us a sense of, of that journey and how different it is to start an operational company versus an investment um, company? Yeah, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. And I'm so thrilled to be to be on and, and doing this. And of course, I would be even more thrilled if we're doing it in Oxford live and get together. But this is great. And I'm so happy that so many people are tuning in. Um, I think for me, it's a journey. And, and the journey is the beautiful thing. The journey is kind of more important than the destination. And um, the journey is one of... Um, believing in entrepreneurship, the power of entrepreneurship, and the believing that we need to um, em encourage and em build new type of companies using technologies uh, everywhere. And, and why do we need to do that? We need to, it's part of um, economic growth, but it's also about building companies that can be, to your theme, building back better, companies that can have a purpose and, 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 and contribute positively to, to uh, for all stakeholders in, in society. And, 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 you know, when, but maybe when I started was that I was, as, when I was, you know, when I was a student in, in Uppsala in Sweden, you know, I was, of course, like I was, you know, we, it was kind of a bit, long time ago, it was like, you know, we were kind of setting up the internet in a way, it didn't really hardly exist. But I was, of course, uh, as many others were, I guess, um, excited about, you know, the, the icons at the time, you know, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and those tech companies in Silicon Valley. And and, uh, uh, and so I thought I always wanted to become an entrepreneur, but then, you know, then I started to, to, to have my professional career and there was really no entrepreneurship. There was no ecosystem at all for entrepreneurs in, in Europe. And 
you really had to be in Silicon Valley to be, that was kind of the one and only tech hub in the world uh, because it had to start somewhere and it was a small community and they worked together and uh, with successful founders, innovators, universities um, um, and, and venture capitalists. And, and uh, But as we started to build, when I started to build my companies in the early 2000s, it was very hard to raise money from, from venture capital investors in Europe. There was, uh, they were very risk averse and everyone kind of discouraged me to, to be an entrepreneur. It's like this risk, you might fail, what's gonna happen? Um, so, but I kind of soldiered on and, and, and it's like, yeah, we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna be successful and, and, and didn't give up. Um, and it was also a, a journey of, multiple failures. Um, it wasn't until Skype that we really had a success. My previous va- uh, ventures, you, you know, mentioned Casa was very, very popular in terms of users. It actually was the most downloaded software app worldwide and, um, you know, half a billion downloads and so forth. And, and But we couldn't make mon- money on it. And as a matter of fact, we got sued for multiple billion dollars. Um, but then when we started to try to raise money again from, from Skype, you know, the, the European VCs did not want to invest. The US VCs like, well, you have like basically like, well, you should come over here. This is obvious place to build your company. But I was a believer of, of European tech and, and opportunities in Europe. And also kind of from a very practical point of view that, you know, we had an amazing uh, tech team uh, in, in here in Europe, in, in Estonia and Tallinn. And, so I, you know, we continue to build here. And for me, this become more and more of my, maybe my personal mission to, yes, to show that we could be as good and, and uh, as Silicon Valley and we could build uh, successful tech companies here in Europe. And, 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 this, and maybe it was because I was stubborn and as an outsider, I wanted to prove a point. <laughs> that was probably very much of it, a chip on my shoulder for sure. But I think the other reasons was also based on facts. You know, the reality is that Europe has some of the best universities in the world. We have some of the best uh, computer science departments and Oxford is of course one of them. And, and um, we also have a very, very good infrastructure with our telecommunications network broadband. And this was, you know, back, you know, this was back, you know, a long time ago in, in, in early 2000 when actually the US broadband and, and mobile networks were pretty patchy. Um, the other thing is that we, Europe had proven to build very successful entrepreneur, founder-led companies in other industries, in retail, in, in, in fashion, in, 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 in pharma, in automotive, and you know, all other kind of industries except tech. So why wouldn't we be able to be successful in tech? So what I realized what we needed, we needed to, in order to build this ecosystem that had been so successful in, in, in Silicon Valley, we needed to also build this in, in Europe. But it wasn't for me, it was never about this, let's copy Silicon Valley. Let's do it differently. Let's do it our way. So I was never a fan of when I had this kind of Silicon Valley comes to Oxford or Silicon Valley comes to whatever Cambridge, whatever. Like, and I actually never went to one of these events because no, 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 we need to do it our way. We should not just try to copy them. And I think now, kind of looking at this now, I'm, I'm, it's even more important that we do it our way because while we Silicon Valley has been such a role model and they have done so many things right, there's also a few things it didn't get right. So we can learn from that, right? And that's also kind of part of the whole entrepreneurial journey. You learn from others, what did it do well? What are some mistakes? What were some of the learnings? How can we do things slightly different? So that is my journey. Uh, it's it's an amazing journey and you know um, we could spend a lot of time in there but but you know we also want to focus on the present and you, you sort of express this confidence in in the European um, ecosystem um, Atomico famously always issues the state of tech in Europe which is yep. a, a, a fabulous report which how are we different in Europe where yeah. do you see emerging strength than where yeah. are you sort of putting your own yeah. money on yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure we are. So it's, first of all, it's remarkable. You know, when I believed in, in that Europe would create big companies, but if you would have, if you would have found an interview by me, like uh, uh, say 2006, when we started um, Atomico, 
if you ask me like, okay, fast forward to 2020, how many kind of billion dollar companies do you think Europe has produced? How many kind of $25 billion companies? You know, would I say hundred over hundred? I don't think so. You know, I would say a lot, several, but but the reality is like when we published our report in, in, in end of last year, over hundred uh, companies in Europe uh, over a billion dollar valuation, people call them unicorns. I think we just need to redefine, set the bar higher because unicorns are supposed to be rare. And and so it is, it is um, we're creating more and more value, which of course is important for the ecosystem to flourish. You need to create economical value, but, but we still don't have, you know, we don't have those trillion dollar companies. And in fact, I, I saw a slide actually, I think from our report that was recycled by Goldman Sachs yesterday, where you have the list of like the hundred, you know, on this, you know, public companies, the hundred most valuable companies. Uh, and of course, at the up, you know, it's like it's a, it's a power law curve in a way that we have the big tech companies stacking up as the biggest one. And then there's like a tail. But one thing that is you know, of this graph is that there's not one European tech company. You have SAP there, right? But it's not like a modern, so that is kind of, there's still work to do there. So I, I, I will, you know, we will create companies in Europe that will be on that list. Absolutely for sure. When will happen? Within a few years, that's, that's gonna happen. That's just, that's, just, that's just a matter of kind of time and, and momentum and, and a statistical, uh, um, uh, events, but what what is so we're still you know we haven't created the, all those huge companies, but because we are such much younger ecosystem. I remember when I started, um, uh, you know, when I kind of yes, when I started to Skype and I can start before that, two thousand and two, two thousand and one, kind of you know two thousand. It was like a nuclear winter after the dot com crash, and. The difference in in the in the U.S. I should not say U.S. because it was just like in one area, which was the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. Um, that was just like that was a crash. That was uh, okay. This difficult time because there had been so many successful companies created, you know, twenty years before that. You know, with Intel and and you know uh, Microsoft and Apple and you know Oracle and and a bunch of companies. So that was, they could just survive that. It's like, it was a few different years. In Europe, literally people thought, okay, this internet thing, it didn't work. We lost money. Let's go back and do what we did before. So it just kind of, it was, uh, we had to restart from the beginning. So this ecosystem is very young. Um, but when you also look at these graphs, uh, I think we had one of these graphs in our report. It's like, actually, the European ecosystem is growing faster than US and, and Asia. So that's great. But what, what the other thing that's different is that it's a distributed one. It's not just like one place. It's now you have successful tech companies that are coming from everywhere in Europe. And I think what we will see now with this pandemic, because we're working from home, it doesn't matter where you are. It's like the world is becoming one tech hub. And we even asking ourselves, like our, our, like, you know, purpose is to invest in European companies, but what is a European company now? Because we're, we're all, all online. But I think other things that we see that, that is kind of on this theme of, of building back better. What I've seen a few things here is that, that, that you know, that um, in the earlier phases of, of tech, it was all about tech. It was, um, you know, was the, you know, starting with like the uh, semiconductors, the internet software, and, and it was, but what we're starting to see now, and, and, and um, we've seen that for a few years, is that tech is now taking on bigger challenges. Tech is now solving problems and transforming non-tech industries, health tech. Um, again, Oxford has some really exciting opportunities there. Using machine learning uh, AI to create uh, uh, treatments for drugs, material science, Aviation, you talked about Lilium, which is an exciting company we invested in, doing electrical airplanes, uh, financial services, um, transportation, cities are being transformed because of tech. So what you happen here is that you have a, a combination of tech and non-tech. So from a culture point of view, I think this is something where maybe like if you take, a, if you look in, around in Europe, where maybe it's easier, I think, to commingle these different cultures, but because the one thing that made, 
uh, kind of the big bang and success of Silicon Valley was that monoculture, which was really enabled them to become so strong in tech. But now I think it's more important to be integrated from a culture point of view. So that's, I think that's an important one, but you know, I think people oversee. The other one is now, because we are a younger ecosystem here, and a few years ago, founders said, I want to build the next Facebook. I hear that less often today. Um, and the reason for that is that they see that there are some things that went wrong with big tech. And, and not because there was a kind of a, a malicious intent. It was just that there was too much focus on optimization, focus on kind of um, uh, optimizing things by being completely data-driven and not really considering you know, what does it mean for all different stakeholders? And as these tech companies become, they're starting small and then all of a sudden they're the biggest company in the world. And it's really hard for them, for the people there in those organizations to understand really what the consequences are. What I see now, young founders who are looking at start companies saying, actually, we want to avoid these things. And, and, and which is great. So they are much, much more thinking about how can we scale these companies in a conscious way? So actually what we do now with Atomico, we engage with companies and talk about these things, like what are some of the stakeholders that could suffer if your company become very successful? How can we, you avoid those things already, already today? Um, diversity and inclusion is something that companies are now thinking about straight from the beginning and engaging with those. How can we build from the beginning, you know, inclusive companies that are diverse? And, and, and so that's, I think, is a, is a big, big difference as well. So I think those, I, when I say that, doesn't mean that young companies in the US are not thinking about this, but, but. So um, this is extremely interesting and, and very consistent with the sort of um, build back better um, theme that no. you know, um, we, we've anchored ourselves. I, I want to dig deeper a little bit um, into that. So. I mean, for example, later today, we're going to have a session on diversity and inclusion. There'll be something on the change in education. Um, we'll be looking at the arts. But um, the one I'm particularly sort of curious about, and I think that you're quite passionate about, is sort of the journey to net zero um, and, and, and the issue of sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. I'd love you to just sort of break down and, and give us your thinking on, on two related things. One is... As an investor, you can focus on technologies, maybe moonshots that you yeah. think are going to change the energy equation. And the second one is you can sort of hold the entire portfolio to a certain higher standard. Yes. How, how do you deal with yes. these issues? That's great. It's a good question. So I think, so again, it's like um, we, we have a limited time to, um, you know, uh, the climate crisis is real and we have limited time. We need to move that need, we need to move, the, change the trajectory of that curve. We all know what we need to do. And, and if I look at that curve, it needs to be changed. That is kind of calling for transformative and disruptive changes. And therefore entrepreneurs and, and technology have a real role to play, but they also need to be in collaboration um, as we heard before with, you know, with, 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 with universities research governments and, and, and all different stakeholders to make it happen. So, um, so it's a real, and I think that we all have a responsibility. If, if we are in a position of, as a business leader, investor, as CEOs, as human beings, we all have a shared responsibility to, to make that happen, right? So we all need to look, what can we do? And, and now we think of what can we do as venture capital investors? You know, at the end of the day, you know, we, um, it's the founders, entrepreneurs, they're the things making it happen. We cannot take any credit for what they do. What we can do, though, is that we can help them, we can guide them. We can, of course, select who we invest in and, and we can in, try to influence them. And, and so there are the two things that you said. It's like you have these kind of companies which are inherently in their business model is that they can really drive um, to, to, to a very positive uh, contribution to reduce uh, carbon emission. And... Lilium is a great example here. If you think about the aviation is one of those industries which are basically being in a Paris Agreement exempt from having to reduce because the aviation industry, rightly so, say our jet engines are as efficient as it can be. We can squeeze half a percentage or something, that's it. They didn't say, hey, maybe we should just think about building electrical engines. They didn't think because they were 
and this is typical, right, in, in, in a legacy industry because you have you have so much competence and this you have vested interest in what you do uh, and what you've done. So then you come like a, an amazing team of, of, of founders from, from Munich uh, with a passion for aviation, but also really, really deep understanding of it saying, actually, we're now at an inflection point where battery technology, battery density is, is good enough so we can actually build uh, electrical airplanes. And also because of computer simulation models, we can design these airplanes very efficiently and composite materials and so on. So if you then can replace a lot of regional short distance and regional transport aviation with, with electrical, that at scale, if this is just a few, it doesn't matter, but it really needs to be at scale. So if this can become at scale with thousands, if you think about like all the airlines, uh, this is not for like transit, this is sh short distance, like 300 kilometers. It will increase with battery um, uh, density increasing. That can be a real game changer when it comes to reducing, reducing carbon emission. Now that's great from an environmental point of view, but I think it's like an amazing investment. I think this is an investment that's gonna be very successful for Atomico and for our investors because it's just the, because the demand will be for electrical aviation. So if you're having the foresight as, as, as Daniel and his team did several, you know, several years ago to create this company and we've been fortunate to invest in that early on, we can benefit from that. So it's a good investment and it's a good purpose. So we really started to understand now that purpose and profit are not mutually exclusive, it's mutually reinforcing. So that's, and we have other, in farm is another great example. So vertical farming company. So instead of having uh, your, your vegetables being shipped across the world with, with on tr trucks that not only uh, produce greenhouse gases, but also means that the, the, the produce are not as nutritious, farming these in, in cities, and uh, uh, reducing carbon emission. And this company is also having a huge demand is rolling out globally with big retailers and consumers love it. So that's again, it's like, it's a good investment. It's good for, for carbon emission. So we have several of those companies that we are looking for invest because we think it actually supports a good investment. Now, that's the other thing that we need to do as, as well. We have with looking at every company that we're investing in and starting with ourselves, uh, uh, what do we, how can we be better in, in, in general as reducing uh, emissions and, and as a company. And this is very much the same methodology as we adopted with, when it comes to, to, to uh, diversity and inclusion, where we realized a few years ago as an industry and also as a firm, we had not done a good job. You know, there were, there were and still are way too much money just going into uh, people like me who are white men who went to a good university. Um, and, and we sort of need really, we need to stop it ourselves and make sure we have a diverse organization. And then we need to make a good work, uh, look for companies, which are founders, which are diverse and also help founders and companies to set up diversity uh, policies and, and, and plans, and which we've done now for, for several years. And we need to do the same thing when it comes to, to, to uh, carbon emission. But I think the bigger game changer is gonna be these companies that actually are replacing replacing kind of legacy solutions that are emitting with, with solutions which are very carbon uh, efficient. That's gonna be really the big game changer because instead of you know uh, making sure that every company investing in have uh, are reducing their footprint because there's there there that's not gonna be the big big difference, but it's still important. Um this is fascinating um, and there, there's lots more to go into, but I'm, I'm going to bring in some of the student questions because we have many great students here. And um, I'll just read out a question by um, Arvind, Arvind Shinlagata, um, who says, good morning, I'm a founder and CEO of a blockchain startup. I would like to know how you dealt with challenges of building the initial team and what are the key attributes you look whilst hiring a new team in a startup? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you start to yeah. talk about diversity. I thought this is a good thing. Yeah. Yes. In. Yes. So we talked about the big picture here and, and how companies can create big challenge, big changes and so forth. But they can only do that if they get started. And getting started is really hard. It's really, really, really hard. And the failure rate is really big. It's like, let's just be clear with that. Is that but that should not stop anyone from, from starting. And it's, it's great that you, you, you're, you're doing this. And, and, it is so important to have that 
first team uh, that you build and 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 how do you get there? So I think that there's a few things because you don't have the success. You know, maybe as a founder, you 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 have some prior success, but mostly it's it's like it's a it's a big risk for someone to come and join you. So I will first encourage you to spend a lot of time to try to find people who who want to join you. And I think the way to do that is one articulate what is your mission with this company and and how big can it become and get people with you on that mission. And also it's, I, in my experience, it's just having co-founders is so much better than being a sole founder. So the first people to bring in maybe is a few co-founders, but you need to make sure that they all, that, that you and your co-founders are aligned on, on, on the mission and the ambition and how to do things, the you know, core values, because otherwise you're going to be going different directions. Um, and the other thing is also that the first few people that you hire are going to be so important in setting the, the kind of the standard, both in culture and also quality for other people. So, so it's hard because <clears throat> when you start, you know, it's just a few people who might want to join you because it's, it's not that everyone's going to believe in you. Um, so you might not be able to hire, you might get believers, but you're not, might, you might not always get the best people. So the hard thing is going to be as you're starting to scale and also when you realize that some of these people that join you early on, while you probably want to be really loyal to them because they believe in you, are they able to scale? And that's where, you know, actually being a CEO is hard because you might have to say goodbye to a few people who believe in you early because they're not going to be the one that can help you make the company successful so that... That is another thing that not to be, you know, you need to be quite tough with that one. Um, thank you. It's very insightful. I'm, I'm, we only have about five minutes, but I'm certainly um, one more question here from Oji Matur that says, um, Nicholas, would you be able to comment on how you see the state of affairs for entrepreneurship in parts of the world that are not under the spotlight? What could those of us in the tech hotbeds be learning from them? And, and let me just add a little bit of color because I'm actually, you know, you've, you've clearly, you know, have a lot of experience working in the Nordics, but um, um, Atomico always had a pan-European view. And I think yeah. this question even goes beyond Europe. So yes. I'd love to hear your thoughts. On yes, that. no, for sure. So I think, um, you know, this pandemic is horrible and, and there's so many people who lost loved ones and, and, and now really many people are suffering from of course, from COVID and, and from mental um, uh, illness because of the whole uh, lock lockdown and everything. But it's also, it's also an enabler. And as I mentioned before, because we're not working from home, uh, it doesn't matter where you are. And I think that's a great opportunity for, uh, because a year ago, it was still kind of which were the tech hubs, like if you take UK, of course, London is the big one. You have Oxford, Cambridge, and, you know, a few others, like, you know, places. But if you were like in Northern, Northern England or, you know, somewhere, it would probably be much harder to, to, to get started. And if you were then somewhere in, say, in uh, Africa, um, it would probably even harder, right? Much, much harder. But, um, what happens, so you have a few things now because we're all working online. First of all, yeah, you, can, you can be everywhere. So that's, that's, that is kind of, it doesn't matter, kind of, it still is, but it, 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 it's, we're, we're getting to a place now where that doesn't really matter. And the other thing is that markets are, because of the penetration of, of internet, um, mobile, um, is getting better everywhere um, and, and technology is getting cheaper. There are more and more opportunities also in, 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 in places that might, may not be as rich and as developed as, as, as the UK is. So I think that there's huge opportunities for entrepreneurs who are you know, building solutions for, um, you know, for, for, for develop, developing countries. And, and, and well, also you can be wherever you are, but also think about this as your team, you don't need to be people who are living next to you anymore. It can be the world. So I think you take this as an opportunity. Wonderful. Um, there um, is an interesting question here um, from a student not identified by name, but um, it basically says that 
you know, established large companies like Amazon, Alibaba, um, Lazada and Asia are, are, you know, becoming extremely dominant. Can we compete or how can yeah. we you know, think? And I think it's, it's true in yeah. the retail industry, which the question yeah. is about, but I think you could broaden it to, to tech in general. Yes. Sure. And you have this situation now, and, and we've seen that it reflects on the stock market and so forth, is that big tech, you know, the big companies getting, the, the rich is getting richer. And, and that's kind of, it's a bit of a scary trend, um, if you just think from a societal point of view, I would say. And, but, and, and also there is kind of threat that they will crush everything, but, you know, they will not. Um, and you just need to be kind of differentiated. So if you're doing something, say, in, in retail, like, you know, don't run in front of Amazon. That's, you know, try to run <laughs> on the side of Amazon instead. Um, because at some point they probably this is likely that they will crush you. But there's also this while you know you take someone like an Amazon or an other big giants, they have very large market share, but they're not going to have 100 percent market share. So you, it's about building something that is differentiated and, and and that are appealing to a different type of audience, a different market segment, and doing something in a different way. And I think that would be you know the, this, this this solution. And uh, you know we're. We're certainly, and other investors are investing in, in, in startups that are doing different type of retail solutions that might be, you know, in the space of, you know, selling things that are similar to what Amazon, but they're doing it in, in a different way. Wonderful. Now, I'm, I know we only have two minutes left, so maybe um, I'll sort of ask the last question on behalf of what I know a lot of students will be, you know, thinking, which is... Um, they're very excited about entrepreneurship. They're very excited yes. about going back, but they're wondering what is the best use of their talent? Yeah. What is your advice? And I mean, it's one thing to start a company. It's yeah. another to join the venture yeah. capital industry, to start a scale. Yeah. Yeah. Where do you see sort of the opportunities for young talent? At yeah. This stage, sort of as your yeah, yeah. closing remark. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We could spend 20 minutes on this one or two hours. Um, so it might be a good reason to come back. Um, so I think there's a unique opportunity now where, first of all, we need to, as we said, we need to bend this curve. The climate curve is one thing, but there's so many other curves that we need to bend. Um, and I think entrepreneurship and, 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 and tech companies are a, a fantastic way to do that. So I would, like, I would encourage everyone to kind of really consider tech as, as, a, as, a, as a career. And by the way, it's also, if you want to make money, that's also probably a good way to, to do that. Um, when I was an entrepreneur, it was like investment banking or, 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 or consulting. Uh, uh, but now actually, I think uh, entrepreneurship can be quite good. But you can also, more importantly though, you can have a real purpose. And then it's about experimenting in the different paths. And, and you, so I think you just get into this, this journey, but there's so much focus on, on, on founders and, and, and as entrepreneurs, and of course, they are so important because they're the ones making it happen. But I think that there is my advice would be to, you know, there you can be an entrepreneur. You don't need to be a founder. You can. We talked about this about the team that early team, you know, join startups uh, or join a scale up to learn, um, um, and because that's also you know like for every founder you need to be like hundreds of non-founders, right? So that. And, and founders, they have blind spots and, 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 and weaknesses. And, and the reason why they're good founders is because they might be horrible in some other things. So working with them, join us a co-founder or just like, you know, one of the first, you know, 20, if you're one of the first 20, 25 people or first 50 people in something that becomes successful, that is great success. And you can really contribute meaningfully with that. And that's also a good way to learn. Um, and, and then you can maybe you do that for a few years you have an experience and then you can go out and maybe start a company or, you know, become an investor. And so there's so many different entry points in this, but I would certainly encourage everyone as many as possible to, to do, do that because being the founder is, is not for everyone. There's certain, you, there's certain characteristics that you need to have. And, and, and it's not like everyone should become a founder because <laughs> that would not really work either. And everyone should not be an investor. Well, um, fabulous. I think there's some, some real nuggets of wisdom here and, and you've lived this. So there's incredible, um, you know, credibility and power behind that. It's been a real privilege uh, um, talking to you. I would love this for two more hours, but, um, you know, our time is on. And yeah. apparently the show must go on. 
And the show oh. you're on is actually the title of the next session, which will start at 10 o'clock um, UK time. So um, on behalf of all the students, on behalf of the Said uh, Business School, um, Nicholas, it's been a real privilege to talk to you. Thank you very much yeah. for your time and best of luck going forward. Yeah. And best of luck to all the students for a wonderful day at OSEP. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Thomas. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for listening. <laughs>